Well, let's digest these latest economic numbers now with Robert Kavchek. He is senior economist at BMO Capital Markets, and as you can see, he joins us right now. Robert, first of all, thank you for stepping in uh, and joining us this morning on a busy morning. Let's talk about the Canadian gross domestic product numbers. I'll do my best to get to the table of data published by StatScan, but let's talk about the headline numbers first. Uh, the numbers come in exactly in line with expectations with a year-over-year economic growth running at 1.9% in the month of May. So that's from May of 2022 to May of this year. From April of this year to May of this year, the number was uh, positive 0.3%. And StatsCan is saying that it looks like June economic growth from May to the end of June was uh, negative to the tune of minus 0.2%. Your, your reaction? Yeah, so the, the May number is in line with expectations. I know that's not a surprise. It was a, it was a strong number. We saw some good data. We had a rebound from the public sector strike. The key, the key in my mind was what's going on in June. And I say that because we saw a pretty negative wave of economic data for June across all, almost all facets of the economy, be it retail, wholesale, manufacturing. A lot of the indicators that flow into the GDP forecast were, were not very good for June. Uh, so the, the the early read here is um, it's it's a bit of a disappointment, uh, but not inconsistent with the data we've seen. So I, I suspect that um, as we kind of scrub the forecast here, and as the Bank of Canada does the same, there's going to be a little bit of downside risk to the second quarter. And I think the Bank of Canada was sitting at one and a half percent, might be a little bit on the high side now. And as we go into Q3, maybe a little bit of softness starting to creep into the economy as well. I'm looking at the table now that shows different sectors of the economy. The big one that, <coughs> excuse me, stands out is management uh, activity down there, 29% uh, year over year uh, in May of this year to May of last year. Uh, public administration uh, positive 3.9%. Uh, there, there is talk. Uh, uh, of the effect that the big labor settlement in Ottawa may have had on that, on that uh, uh, June number. Uh, where would you expect to see some of the big, what, what sectors of the economy were you watching ahead of this uh, release? Sure. Well, the public sector is a is a temporary kind of swing factor that we knew was gonna was gonna be in play here, and it was for for May. So, I think we can kind of scrub that out and move on. I think I think bigger picture is we're kind of starting to see some evidence that. Um, you know, almost 500 basis points of, of tightening compressed in a very short window of time is starting to have an impact on, on the economy more broadly. And we're seeing it in areas like housing. Uh, we're seeing it in areas like consumer spending, where spending volumes at the retail level have really flattened out, even though we are you know, seeing very strong demographic and population flows. Uh, and business investment's been been a little bit a little sluggish and, and choppy as well. So, um, one area where you know we, we haven't seen a lot of weakness yet is in the job market, but we're coming off just such extremely tight levels there. And I think that's going to be one of the questions going forward over the next couple of months is, is the labor market going to start to slacken a bit more? We've seen some early evidence that a lot of the excess demand for labor is starting to get kind of chipped away. Um, and I think I, you know that's that's one area we focused on going forward over the over the next um, the next few months, and probably the Bank of Canada is going to be looking pretty closely as well. Okay, let's move to the United States, where we have received P, what are known as PCE deflator numbers. It's another uh, measure of price changes in the U.S. economy. It, uh, the difference between this measure and the Consumer Price Index is that uh, the PCE deflator takes into account changes in consumer behavior. One example uh, that is often mentioned is that, if, for instance, if beef prices rise, consumers may buy less beef and more chicken, and this measure takes that kind of shift in consumer uh, preferences and behavior into account as a, a, is, I think, regarded as a more accurate measure of what consumers are, are actually paying uh, at the cash register. It's, uh, again, often referred to as the Fed's favored measure of price change in the U.S. economy, and it has fallen, uh, Robert, uh, to its lowest level since March of 2021. What's your takeaway here? Well, it, it is the Fed's preferred measure, so they're going to be keyed in on what that core inflation rate is doing, and that slowing is encouraging. I think I think a year ago we had a pretty big month-over-month -month print, so there's some base effects at work there as well. Um, it, it fits in the broader picture that that we are seeing a very gradual improvement in, in core inflation trends in the U.S. economy and Canada as well. And so this is kind of another feather in that cap. I think, I think the Fed is really going to be keyed in on what's happening over the last 
you know, three months or so on an annualized basis, presumably some slowing there. We've seen some slowing in, in the CPI on that front as well. And then even like more specifically drilling into what's happening into the core of the service sector, because in, in the Fed's opinion, that's really what's swinging inflation incrementally at the margin right now, right? They want to look past what's happening in housing. Um, we've, we, we, we've pretty much defeated inflation on the good side of the economy. So that core service sector is what they're really keyed into there. And we're seeing some evidence that that's, that's cooling down as well. Is it where they want it to be? No. I mean, the underlying run rate in some of these measures is still in that three to 4% range. So well above where they want it to be, but the direction is encouraging. And so from a policy perspective, I think they're starting to get some, some signs here and the Bank of Canada is as well that policy probably is restrictive enough at this point uh, the question is going to be how long do we have to stay at these restrictive levels to, to fully defeat this inflation problem? Again, the uh, that PCE deflator number comes in on an annualized basis at 3.0% on a month-to-month -month basis. That's from May to June, 0.2%, uh, both anticipated by economists. The number is... Uh, uh, on an annual basis, higher in core deflator, which, as you can imagine, strips out some volatile items. That number comes in at 4.1%. We also have uh, the employment cost index number that is often referred to, and this is in the U.S. This is a, a measure of employment cost. That number comes in for the second quarter at growth of 1.1%, and that is a moderation uh, from 1.2% in the uh, the first quarter. Uh, is that a uh, uh, how significant an input is that to U.S. inflation, Robert? Well, it, it's a key because the Fed is pretty clearly dialed into wage growth here. And, and the way this this tends to play out is you have inflationary pressure that then, you know, drives wage pressure, which kind of reinforces the inflationary cycle. And especially when they're looking at a, a job market that is still extremely tight, um, even short term indicators like like jobless claims where you would maybe start to sniff out a little bit of softness at this point, given the tightening we've seen push through the system. We're, we're just not seeing it yet. Like some of the excess demand has been chipped away, yes, but we're not seeing any slack really built in the labor market at this point. So wage growth is one thing they're going to uh, have their eye on, on, on for sure. And, you know, until we start to see a, a really distinct flattening out or, or cooling off of, of some of the wage pressure, I think there's, it's going to be really hard for them to, to, to turn around and start cutting rates. So we would think this is very much a, a story for 2024 still. Okay, let's finish uh, with Canada. Um, uh, June economic growth, according to StatsCan, in a preliminary estimate called the Flash Estimate, contracted by 0, uh, 0.02%. Uh, your takeaway there, what does it mean to Canadian inflation and ultimately to the Bank of Canada? Well, so I think the short story here is it's it's maybe an early sign that almost 500 basis points of tightening is starting to work. I think um, from a technical perspective, it probably opens up some downside risks for the Bank of Canada's near-term forecast. And keep in mind, they just they just came off a deliberation period where the first quarter came in much stronger than they were expecting. So perhaps the scales have tilted a little bit from from their perspective in terms of the near-term growth forecast. Um, kind of reinforces that we are seeing some some persistent disinflation pressure. Again, are we where we want it to be or where are we where the Bank of Canada wants it to be when you have their underlying core measures running around, you know, the three, three and a half percent mark? Not quite, but it does suggest that policy, when you look at where real policy rates are today, if you assume underlying inflation of around, you know, three, three and a half percent, one and a half percent or so on the real policy rate seems to be tight enough to be kind of slowing the gears of the economy. I think the question is, again, how long they have to have to sit at these levels and lean on it. We think probably for some time still through the rest of this year. And uh, I, I think those are maybe some of the conversations they're going to be having as, as they go over the course of the next couple of meetings.